Welcome to this week's lecture on the social system. As you know, this is one of the three pillars of sustainability and we turn our attention to it in this particular topic. To start things off, let's look at a couple of companies that are working towards developing social sustainability. These headings on the slide are taken from the Guardian newspaper. From sofas to cushion covers to bed linen to lampshades, IKEA uses a lot of cotton, around 0.7% of the world's cotton supply, in fact. Under conventional cotton farming techniques, this would mean the environmental um, impact and the communities would be paying a really high price. IKEA actually sources 74% of the cotton it uses from sustainable sources, and this actually has probably increased to 100% by now. The cotton brings substantial social and environmental benefits for the many thousands of growers across its supply chain. AMIA is a data-driven marketing and loyalty analytics company based in Canada. It has close to 4,000 employees in over, two, over 20 countries. Their core business lies in a customer data management um, and analytics system. So when Centerpoint, a youth homelessness charity, wanted to understand how they could better help young people rebuild their broken lives, they turned to AMIA. The results were dramatic. As well as shaping the way Centerpoint works with vulnerable young people, AMIA's data philanthropy program helped the charity to renew several high value contracts. And in 2014 alone, to win more than 1.5 million pounds in, in that currency of new funding. In the past two years, the company has supported more than 50 charities and donated more than 15,000 hours of pro bono analytical support. So after that introduction and example of two companies, this is what we're hoping for you to learn once you've worked through this topic. Firstly, obviously, define the concepts of social capital and social sustainability. Explain the importance of the social part of the green economy. And finally, describe the relationship between policymaking, social inclusion, and community building using a systems lens. So let's start off with the first topic, ILO, social capital and social sustainability. The first thing to recognize is actually that social sustainability is the least defined and least understood um, of the different ways of approaching sustainability and sustainable development. In fact, I call it the poor cousin of the three pillars. So when you think about the environmental pillar and the economic pillar, those are far better understood, defined and associated with sustainability. And that has a lot to do with the fact that the issues that social sustainability covers, such as diversity, um, you know, human rights, modern slavery, these are all addressed by different forms of legislation in a lot of countries. And so they don't lend themselves, it doesn't lend itself to the kind of voluntary nature of, say, environmental sustainability. Also, historically, as we covered in the environmental system, the association of sustainability has in the past been a lot more strong, uh, strongly associated with environmental sustainability. So because of this, social sustainability has had considerably less dialogue and less attention um, than the economic and environmental pillars. So here on this slide is one definition of what social sustainability is. So please have a read of it. So when talking about social sustainability, what exactly are we talking about? So according to the Western Australian Council of Social Sustainability, there are five key areas that are covered. Firstly, equity. So, you know, providing equitable opportunities and outcomes for all members of a community, particularly those who are the poorest and most vulnerable. 
Although equity is listed as a separate principle, it's such a fundamental component that it can't really be separated from the other principles. Equity is really a filter through which all the other principles are viewed, which brings us to the second one, say, around diversity. So when you have a diverse community, it is one that promotes and encourages diversity as well as inclusion. Thirdly, interconnectedness. So this is where a community provides processes, systems, and structures that promote this connectedness within and outside the community at the formal, informal, as well as institutional levels. Fourthly, quality of life. So this is where people's basic needs are met and it fosters a good quality of life for all members at the individual group as well as community levels. And finally, democracy and governance. So the community in this case provides democratic processes and open and accountable governance structures. So these five elements are deconstructing the definition that you just saw in the previous page. And the list on the right is an extension of these principles into more specific issues and examples for you to consider. When you looked at the economic system and we introduced to different forms of capital, social capital was one of the ones that, one form of capital that you were introduced to. It has a number of definitions and uh, it's been used in business for example, to illustrate how connecting people can increase a company's bottom line. However, from a sustainability perspective, social capital is a set of norms, networks, and organizations through which people gain access to power and resources and through which decision-making and policy formation occur. So that's, as I said, one definition. If you were to think about how you relate this to business, essentially, if you think of obviously people's relationships within a business and outside, that's an important source of social capital. But in today's increasingly networked world, social capital is also monetized extensively by, for example, um, social media companies who rely on the relationships that people have amongst um, each other as a way to kind of create and extract value and be able to sell advertising and products, et cetera. So that network effect becomes a really important aspect that businesses are able to monetize. Another important concept related to social capital is that of social agency. So the focus of social capital formation lies at the heart of it. Um, but social agency, which is drawn from sociology, is the individual's ability for self-determination or free will. So agency is the ability to respond to events outside of one's immediate sphere of influence to produce a desired effect. So while networks can build the social capital, um, based on previous research, we've learned that agency both at the individual and collective level is actually needed to mobilize the social capital for sustainable community development. So in other words, you can have social capital which sits as a stock, but in order to move that, you need individual and groups ability to have greater self-determination and free will in order to mobilize that. So in other words, both agency and capital are need to be available in a community if you're really going to try and bring about change. One of the concepts that you're introduced to in this topic's uh, prescribed reading is the difference between a social market versus a free market. So social market economy is an idea that's been um, really adopted in a lot of the welfare states, say in Scandinavia or even in England, and something that differentiates a, a social market from a free market is that the actual country or nation state and the market economy are not separate entities, but are one object of human invention, which is then called the market society. So this means that it's not about separating government from economic problems, 
Um, and it's not the same as socialism per se. So the social framing of economics, which is what this tries to do, is to create a stronger link between economic development and social equity outcomes of that development. Okay, and so this links back to intern intergenerational equity because focusing on the outcomes of economic development also brings to the fore that people are central to that economic development. So you can't have economic development without society and you can't support a society without economic development. So that's why it makes sense to have them linked um, and to have them going forward together rather than separate. And then the final extension or interpretation of this is the implication that social sustainability has on inter and intragenerational equity considerations. So for example, if you look at the links between society and the economy that we just spoke about, um, that has implications because if you think of people's basic needs and their well-being, that's going to be that's going to differ across countries in the current generation. But when we think about society's relationship with the environment, we tend to think of this very much in intergenerational terms. So in other words, what impact will taking care of the environment today have on future society and future generations? So that's how the generational link is made across economy, society, and the environment. Okay, but then if we were to look, even though it's outside the scope of this particular topic, the link, just because I want to explain this um, diagram, the link between the economy and the environment is very much about how we value and how we account for that economics and social, sorry, economic and environmental capital. So it's a valuation um, issue, but also resource efficiencies that we spoke about in one of the previous classes. So decoupling economic growth from environmental use. So this is a nice little slide that summarizes um, everything we've been discussing in the three pillars so far. So for the review and reflect, um, I'd like you to watch a video um, in terms of what we need to what we need to do in order to sustain and enhance a wealthy social system. So Carl Hen, this is a video with Carl Henrik Robert, who is the founder of the Natural Step. And in this video, he presents five key factors for social sustainability. The Natural Step is a leading nonprofit from Sweden that aims to increase the sustainability of human activities on Earth. For the second learning outcome in this particular topic, we consider the concept of social in the context of the green economy. In this particular learning outcome, we're going to look at two things. Firstly, some of the emerging social-based uh, business models, and then the role of business in human rights. When we think of some of the innovative and new ways that businesses are approaching social issues and ways to address social sustainability, this diagram here, this continuum rather, which looks at social as well as dollar-based return on investments, as I said, it's a nice sort of neat way of looking at innovative ways that businesses are addressing these issues. So on the left side, you have public or not-for-profit ownership. And on the right, you have private businesses or by definition, they're for profit. So social enterprises and socially responsible business, which offer what's called the blended return on investment, which are shown as pink on this particular slide. These are hybrid organizations that trade goods and services in order to achieve social, environmental, economic, and sometimes cultural outcomes. And so this spectrum is, is, as I said, is useful to look at where you have traditional charities 
on the one hand and traditional businesses on the other hand with the social enterprise and other things occupying the middle. This continuum is really there mostly for illustrative purposes because you'll find most businesses do tend to move towards the sort of middle and center. You will really find um, something, particularly a business that strictly seeks profit only. I think most businesses, particularly large ones, do offer some social return on their investment. Um, and if you think about real world businesses, you know, if you've come across Tom's Shoes, for example, which is a business where for every shoe that you buy, one pair of shoes is donated to someone um, in need. So um, you also learned, you had a quiz in the subject on the Thank You Project. So that's an Australian based social enterprise where all profits are reinvested into social or environmental projects. If you think about organizations like the Red Cross, companies like the Body Shop, they all occupy a unique space somewhere on this continuum. So social enterprises like the Thank You Project, they provide a unique alternative to traditional social service provision. So normally social, environmental and cultural initiatives are developed and implemented by the government or the public sector. Um, and they're often delivered in partnership with either the private sector or with charities. But government agencies now actually have another option and they're increasingly partnering with such social enterprises to develop innovative um, approaches to solving some of the tough problems. So in summary, social enterprises combine public benefit with commercial acumen and is sometimes described as the fourth sector because the approach combines aspects of all three traditional ways of operating. So business, not-for-profit, government, and social enterprise being the fourth. Most governments across the world, um, including, of course, the Australian government, believe that business and respect for human rights go hand in hand. Businesses here must comply with all Australian laws. And in addition, under international law, the government is um, obliged to ensure that non-state actors, which include businesses, respect human rights. It's long been recognized that businesses can have a profound impact on human rights. This impact can be positive, of course, for example, by delivering innovation and services that can improve people's standards of living and quality of life, but it can also be negative. For example, where business activities destroy people's livelihoods, exploit workers or displace communities. But we know that international human rights treaties generally do not impose direct legal obligations on businesses. Instead, states are responsible for enacting and enforcing national legislation that can have the effect of requiring companies to respect human rights, such as laws that mandate minimum working age. There are some exceptions in different areas of the law. For example, international humanitarian law also imposes obligations on private actors, including individuals and companies. In 2008, um, expert professor John Ruggie proposed a, what, what's very famously now known as the Protect, Respect and Remedy Policy Framework for businesses um, to adopt in relation to human rights. This was adopted unanimously by the Human Rights Council and the framework rests on three key pillars. Pillar one is the state duty to protect against human rights abuses by third parties. Pillar two is a corporate responsibility to respect human rights. And thirdly is um, access to remedy by the victims both judicial and non-judicial non remedy. So these three pillars, so protect, respect, and remedy are the three central pillars of businesses' involvement with human rights. One particular issue related to human rights that I want to talk to you about today is modern slavery. Now it can take many different forms and refers to instances of human exploitation where the victim 
cannot refuse or leave their place of work. In 2018, there was a global slavery um, index, and that estimated there are over 40 million victims of modern slavery practices across the world. And in Australia, there were found to be at least 15,000 victims. So many Australian supply chains lead directly to the Asia Pacific region, where it's estimated that there are over 30 million people in human trafficking, forced labor or debt bondage situations. So that's where the majority of modern slavery is seen um, to be. And many people then became aware of modern slavery only when the Australian government introduced the Commonwealth Modern Slavery Bill in 2018. So the Australian Modern Slavery Act, which I said, and that's a Commonwealth-based act, um, was, came into effect in 2018. So essentially what this act does is um, create or establish a modern slavery reporting requirement. So businesses in Australia with an annual revenue of more than 100 million need to prepare a statement which outlines the risks of forced labor and modern slavery in their operations and supply chains. So it's really a reporting requirement um, through these statements. It's not like they have to actually do anything about it. The other thing is that these statements need to be publicly available through an online register. So a study by the Monash Centre for Financial Studies found that more than one third of Australian ASX 300 listed companies failed to meet the minimum reporting standard. This was in 2019. So there's currently no punishment for companies who fail to comply with the reporting requirements of the Act. This legislation very much relies on concerned consumers taking notice of reporting failures and making buying decisions accordingly. So the real form of punishment, it's meant to be coercive where if your consumers find out that you're not reporting um, or not reporting well, they're more likely to choose a competitor's product. So you can see why this is a very unrealistic and unfair responsibility to place on consumers um, to change the ethical business behavior. But it's a start, and I think it's an encouraging way to signal to the market and through legislation that this is something to be taken seriously, but there's still a bit of work needed. All right, so that brings us to the end of this topic. Uh, for this particular review and reflect, um, I'd like you to read four mini case studies uh, on Adidas, Diageo, ASOS, and Unilever, and classify whether the approach that they've taken, um, sorry, these are best case, exa best case examples, um, and I want you to classify whether that particular company's approach can be classified as engagement with suppliers, supply chain transparency, engagement with workers, or access to remedy. So there's one for each, um, and don't use any one of those more than, more than once. So for the final um, learning outcome for this particular topic, we will look, we'll look at the concept of social inclusion and the role of government and policy in promoting social inclusion. So in addition to obviously defining what social inclusion is, 
We'll also be having a bit of a discussion why it's important, what the benefits of social inclusion are. So what do you think social inclusion is? So this is a definition that's given by the Australian Social Inclusion Board. Um, also think about, and is highlighted on this slide, why would people feel socially excluded? Um, and if people are to be included socially, what must they be given the opportunity to do? So these are the central features of a definition for social inclusion. So the key principles for social inclusion are that in order to feel and to be socially included, people must be given the opportunity to secure a job, to access services, connect with family, friends, work, personal interests, and local community. They need to also be given um, the opportunity to deal with personal crises and have their voices heard. The aims of social inclusion also include reducing disadvantage. So, you know, people being able to reach the same level in society. Um, and so you have less of a difference in earning potential, for example, or other, you know, historical disadvantages. The other aim is to increase social, civic, and economic participation. These are the three key tenets of a well-functioning society and a well-functioning economy and government. So really giving everyone the skills that they need so they can work and connect with the community, even during hard times. And so during COVID, for example, we saw that people's economic participation, social as well as civic participation was at an all-time low. And that's a really useful way to look at the consequences of not having this, is it creates a number of economic, social, environmental, mental health, um, and other issues where we don't have that kind of participation. And then the other aim is to give people to communities, groups, individuals, a greater voice along with greater responsibility. So, the days of big government, you know, particularly in Western democracies, um, you know, those, the role of big government, it shifts up and down. But in the whole, what we really want, or what governments seek to achieve through improving social inclusion is to actually give people a voice so that they can then tell and uh, work with their local representatives and elected officials so that they can be heard in terms of what they want how they work um, and making the best use of opportunities that they have available. I'm now going to introduce you to two policy approaches to um, increasing social inclusion. One is what's called a social capital orientation. So this is where um, investments are made to capitalize social, sorry, the investments are made to increase social capital and in that way improve inclusion. So trying to connect people with their wider communities and society. So you can have a, a look on this slide on the list of ways that you can use, so build um, social inclusion through investing in social capital. The second policy approach to increasing inclusion is what's called a human capital orientation. So this is where you actually, as you know, human capital is about the skills within a person. So this is about building those skills that will allow individuals to contribute to the overall group, to the country, to the industry. And this has become actually the more dominant orientation of government policy and funding. So upskilling people, subsidizing education, uh, training and employment, funding of university places. So these are all ways that the government seeks to make people more productive and included parts of members of society. From an Australian policy perspective, um, it's been a while now, but the government launched a report in 2010 called A Stronger, Fairer Australia, which sets out the government plan for achieving the vision of social inclusion. It's an agenda really for change. 
Um, so based on evidence about the causes and consequences of social and economic disadvantage in Australia, there are six key priority areas that the government found that it needed to work on in order to increase um, social inclusion. Firstly, it was around jobless families with children, children at greatest risk, homelessness, people with a disability or mental illness, Indigenous Australians, Indigenous Australians, and finally, tried to break the cycle of entrenched and multiple disadvantage. So it's this, you can see how just by hearing about these policy areas that it makes sense to invest in these in order to improve social as well as human capital and thereby increase inclusion. All right, so bring, that brings us to the end of this topic, learning outcome and also of the topic. Um, and for the review and reflect of this particular Tylo, what I'd like you to do is click on the link uh, and read just the executive summary of this report, which are, you'll find on pages six and seven. Um, so this is a report that was commissioned by SBS, which is an Australian broadcaster and undertaken by Deloitte Access Economics. The report is called The Economic Benefits of Improving Social Inclusion. Um, so yeah, have a read of the executive summary and I'd like you to answer four questions based on that. All right, so in preparation for next week, I'd obviously like you to review what you've learned this week. Um, also read ahead and prepare for the next topic, which is on stakeholders and governance and read and watch um, any of the prescribed materials for next week as well.